welcome everyone to this second advanced symposium for the California Bicycle Summit. It's the second of three. Uh, the next one in February is going to be uh, led by local advocates who have had some amazing successes in their community. The one that happened uh, uh, last time, the first one was an amazing presentation by John Pooker and Ralph Bueller from their book, uh, City, uh, Cycling Cities. And one of the chapters in that book is the feature today. Two of the authors, uh, Professors Carlos Pardo and Daniel Rodriguez are here to talk about what we can learn from what's going on in Latin America. Uh, but first, I want to uh, uh, introduce uh, a couple of folks who are behind the scenes. Kevin Claxton. Hi, Kevin. Hi, all. The development associate. That's Stephanie Alfaro. Uh, she's our admin assistant. And if you have any technical questions, you can uh, send them a chat. Uh, and uh, Stephanie uh, uh, first, and uh, they'll, they'll try to help you out. Um, uh, also, uh, here on our staff is Jen Guitard, our development director. Say hi, Jen. Hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. Sorry, my camera wasn't working. Um, and Cynthia Rose, our board chair, will join us before the end. Um, before we jump into the advanced symposium, though, I want to talk for a minute about the in-person summit coming up in April. The California Bicycle Summit is the favorite thing of ours that we do, of, of mine. It's my, it's my favorite cow bike project. Every two years, uh, we bring together hundreds of advocates, planners, officials, industry people to talk about what it's gonna take to win our agenda of making our communities more equitable, more prosperous, more healthy, more safe, more fun, more joyful through bicycling. And it's an amazing event. Uh, this year's uh, event is going to be in Oakland. I want to talk uh, a little bit about the venue and the content. Uh, the California Bicycle Summit is going to be held in Oakland, California. Uh, that is uh, where our headquarters is located. So we have the opportunity to uh, take advantage of our relationships with local businesses to make it a fantastic event. Uh, the venue is an interesting place. It's owned by uh, Oak Stop. Oak Stop is a local event center, uh, African-American owned business that uh, is uh, has converted a bunch of gallery spaces to meeting spaces and, and owns also the California Ballroom, which you saw earlier, uh, an amazing, uh, beautiful, uh, you know, event center uh, for, for our plenaries. Um, the reason I'm excited about it is, is of many reasons. Uh, it's in two separate spots. The ballroom is a block away from the event center. So we'll get to to walk along the, the streets and to experience the improvements that Oakland is making for walking and bicycling. The owner of our space is very much a leader and an advocate for safe streets for biking and walking. And that's one of the reasons why we're thrilled to be working with them. Um, also, uh, uh, we're gonna have an opportunity to close the street in front of the venue. The venue has, as you saw, some amazing, uh, breakout rooms with very good acoustics and beautiful light, former art galleries, uh, but it doesn't have a lobby. And you know how at conferences, some of the best thing to, things to do are to hang out in the lobby and network with people. So we're gonna turn the street in front of the event center into a lobby. We're gonna close it off and uh, enjoy uh, the conviviality of each other on the street. That's uh, thanks to Oakland uh, Department of Transportation supporting us on that. Um, the uh, event will have some fun social events. We'll have a movie night. Uh, I'm sure uh, we'll have a, a, a cocktail party. 
And then on Friday, we'll have a dance party, always a dance party uh, per my insistence. But this one is gonna be associated with um, the bike party. Let me pause that for a second. Uh, the bike party is a monthly event of social ride that goes through the streets of the East Bay and they are willing to go through Oakland on the Friday that will be there so that we can join them on their bike ride, which always includes uh, at least three dance parties. They ride for a few miles, they stop, they dance, they jump back on their bikes. Uh, it's really going to be a great event that way. Um, now to touch on the content a little bit, the theme of the event in Los Angeles was intersections. Uh, that the picture there is Tamika Butler, Komi Ajise, and Ryan uh, Russo of the Oakland Department of Transportation. Uh, they were speakers at that event. Um, Ryan, of course, is going to be there at this one. Uh, the theme this year is uh, not going uh, to be intersections. It's going to be something we haven't decided yet. We have an amazing steering committee putting together the content. It's going to be something uh, along the lines of we're tired of waiting. It's taking too long to make our cities safe for bicycling and walking. What can we do to speed things up? We're, it's just time to move. The, the climate crisis and, uh, and, and everything else calls for uh, speeding up the progress of change. Uh, we're gonna have some VIP presentations and we're gonna have some really cool grassroots presentations too from, for example, the people who do the ride outs uh, all over the state. Uh, it's, it's gonna be a super great event. Um, the uh, price is 425 bucks. The early bird price ended in on November 30th. It was only 295, but for everyone who's here, uh, you can register today. If you register today, you can get the $295 price. It's, it's a special advanced symposium discount. Um, so I hope you take advantage of that. It's definitely worth it. You can uh, register for it at calbike.org slash summit. Um, and so I hope you can come to that. And with that, I get to now introduce the speakers for uh, the symposium. We have uh, Daniel Rodriguez and uh, Carlos Pardo, who are the co-authors of the book about Latin America in, in uh, the City Cycling book. Daniel Rodriguez is the Chancellor Professor of City and Regional Planning and Interim Director of the Institute for Transportation Studies at University of California, Berkeley. He, his research focuses on active transportation, health, and the environment. His co-author, Carlos Pardo, is currently a senior advisor to NUMO. He has worked on several projects focusing on topics such as bicycle strategies for cities, travel demand management, and urban development. He founded Despacio, uh, a Bogota-based sustainable transportation organization, and was its executive director until joining NUMO. And he is the honored recipient of the Cycling Embassy of Denmark's 2018 Leadership Award. Speaking of Bogota, uh, we are pleased to also have a couple of people from BC Activa, which is uh, a radio station based in Bogota for and by cyclists. Lorena Romero is the BC, BC Activa Foundation's uh, director and project manager. She has been a bike activist in Colombia for more than eight years, and she was at our summit in 2019, gave a very popular presentation. She is the creator of the Be Cinema Project, which is an initiative to share movies in public spaces for urban communities in Bogota's disadvantaged neighborhoods, been nominated for several awards for community radio, and won grants from their mayor's office to expand uh, media reach and bike advocacy in the city. I'm looking forward to hearing her presentation, which is given with her colleague, Rafael Navarro, who uh, is also from Bogota, but currently based in the Netherlands, where he's working as a European reporter for BC Activa, uh, sharing the Dutch uh, cycling experience with, with uh, folks in uh, throughout Latin America. He is an urban cyclist and a bike enthusiast, has worked for various bike advocacy groups in Bogota, including the Ciclo Readers, a reading and bike initiative. What an amazing uh, and, and, and diverse group of 
presenters that we have. I'm so grateful uh, to you, uh, professors and Lorena and Raphael. Thank you so much. We're gonna there. We're gonna have three presentations. Uh, probably last close to forty minutes, and then we'll have time for uh, some discussion afterward. And so, with that, why don't we start with? Um, is it uh, Daniel? Are you starting? Yes, Dave. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction, and uh, thanks to Calbike for organizing this second symposium. It's wonderful to be here today. So we divided our presentation with Carlos with uh, me going with the first ten minutes, uh, giving you an, an overview of bicycling in Latin America, and this is part of that chapter that Dave mentioned. And then Carlos will be giving us a more up to date. Uh, presentation of what's happened since COVID and a lot of the innovations that have taken place uh, since. So uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having us. Why uh, Latin America? So this was uh, an interesting question uh, that that came up as we were talking with uh, Ralph uh, Bueller and John Pooker um, in the previous uh, in the first edition of uh, the City Cycling Book that now became Cycling for Sustainable Cities. Latin America didn't have its own space. It was mentioned here and there, but uh, Ralph and John were visionary uh, to realize that Latin America had its own story to tell. It's uh, the, one of the highest urbanized regions in the world. More than 90% of the population lives in cities. But at the same time, it also has significant income disparities and uh, segregation problems. So there's both opportunities, challenges uh, for this region of the world and a mixed record of innovation. So some cities ha have been highly innovative uh, and you'll hear the case of Bogota specifically as a leader, and others have lagged behind. And it's not really only large cities, it's medium and small cities have been innovative, and some have also been laggards. So I really encourage you to take a look at the chapter for more details. I'm going to just uh, provide a, a couple of highlights that we think are important with edited and updated uh, figures. But for more detail, you certainly can go to the chapter. Or frankly, if you want to email us uh, or get in touch with us, we can uh, also send you that chapter if interested. So here, here's the bottom line, I think. What, what has, how does, how did the change happen in Latin America? The change was uh, in multiple, or came from multiple directions. It came from uh, the grass tops. So top-down uh, uh, elected officials that had um, very strong ideas about uh, how to diversify the mobility ecosystem and specifically encourage bicycling and uh, walking, sort of active transport, but also from the grassroots. There's been a very strong grassroots effort to uh, push other modes of transportation, more sustainable modes of transportation, and make sure that communities voices were represented in the transportation planning process. So funding has been critical. You'll see the change in infrastructure um, over time in various cities. There's also been a change not only in the funding process, but also in how projects get prioritized. Uh, so bicycle projects compete hand in hand with uh, uh, bus rapid transit and with street improvement projects. At the same time, and not by coincidence, demand management for automobiles became more prominent, specifically managing parking supply and the implementation of circulation controls, basically uh, um, constraints to using your vehicle during peak hours, depending on uh, certain aspects of your license plate, the last number of your license plate, odd or even, for example. Uh, integration with other modes, specifically for bicycles and public transportation has become more prominent the building of separated infrastructure, and then the snowballing effect, seeing that, wow, that city did that, and it's becoming much more sustainable. It's having a lot of interesting uh, attention and uptake from users. Let's do that too. So there's been kind of the leaders, and then now the later adopters that are le learning the lessons from those leaders, and in some cases doing a very good job in implementing their uh, bicycle programming, their policies, and their infrastructure. So uh, this figure here uh, shows the share of trips by bicycle based on household travel surveys in the last decade. Uh, the book has a, a broader cross section of cities. I did a selection here to make the graph a little easier and a little more current. 
But two studies uh, stick out here in terms of mode chair, and this is actually for, for entire trips. So this is not for multimodal trips. Bogota has eight point, I'm sorry, 6.6% here on the left, and Guadalajara, uh, the, the high bar on the right, has 8.3% 8, 8 uh, mode share. Guadalajara uh, and Bogota, no coincidence too, also have the most ambitious Sunday streets or open streets programs in the Americas. Uh, more recently, other uh, development bank surveys, one that covers 11 cities, has asked about uh, the use of different travel modes to get to destinations, including not only work, but also school, errands, and so on, on a typical day. And they used bicycle as one of the legs in how people reported their trips. And from that uh, survey, uh, the numbers or the share of bicycle in any type of trip or in a leg of a trip uh, increased to about 10%. The same was true of city, a couple of cities in Brazil and in other parts of Latin America, like uh, Caracas or La Paz, Bolivia, uh, the share even then when we're thinking about bicycles as a uh, access or egress mode as a part of a more complex trip reached only 1%. So this is the type of diversity that I wanted to provide uh, and, and show you across the various cities, not unlike what we see here in the US, not unlike what we see here in California. So um, how has this happened? So uh, I think there's been leadership in terms of the provision of separated infrastructure, separated bicycle infrastructure, meaning separated from the uh, main automobile lanes, so the main motorized vehicle lanes. This figure here shows the supply of that infrastructure by city over time. And it's really two time periods that are very close to each other, 2015 and 2018. But you see significant changes, uh, the difference between the green bar and the blue bar for cities like Bogota that increased 25%. And in fact, you'll hear from, from Carlos in a minute that Bogota is up to 550 kilometers. So it's already 10% higher than what it was in 2018. Adding percentage at this high level is challenging, but they were able to add almost 30 more miles of separated bike lanes since. Uh, but other cities have done very well too. You see here Santiago and Buenos Aires are starting from slightly lower levels, but they've been able to add significant infrastructure. Uh, and Guadalajara, again, unsurprisingly, shows the most dramatic gains during this time period. This is how Bogota's uh, separated infrastructure uh, looks like. This is one example of, of several types of infrastructure. This is a, an early example that attempted to uh, fully take away the infrastructure from the side of the road and uh, bring the bicyclists a little closer to the pedestrians. Uh, you see a prominent feature in Bogota that is now changing, which is this uh, pedestrian and bicycle uh, bridges to cross these busy streets. That is now uh, changing as the city is embarking in a, in a strategy to remove those and create um, at grade crossings for uh, active transportation users and avoid kind of this circuitous route of having to go uh, out of your way up and then again down. The infrastructure nowadays looks a little closer to this. Uh, this is kind of a, a classic type of um, slow street with uh, the bicycle lanes on the right hand side here um, uh, with, with quite a significant amount of space for being able to, uh, uh, to traverse. Um, do you build it? Will it come? And so this is a, a, our kind of assessment in the, in the book chapter of the association between how much separated uh, bicycle infrastructure there is in each city and the percentage of trips by bicycle. So it's not a perfect correlation. The size of the, of the circles here denotes the population size of each city, um, but it does show us a positive trend, which is why we would expect, in fact, this correlation is about 0.35. So the cities that have a quite significant amount of infrastructure are seeing a higher percentage of trips by bicycle with some outliers uh, above the graph, like the Guadalajara's of the world, and some other areas, particularly larger cities like Lima, Sao Paulo, and Mexico City under the curve um, that have significant uh, infrastructure, but not quite a high modal share for bicycle. The last point I want to make before passing it on to, uh, to Pardo is uh, that policies, programming, and promotion have been critical to the success of 
uh, bicycle mobility in these cities. Uh, this is based on a survey that we conducted for our book chapter. So it's a, a small N, anywhere between 20 and 24 cities. But we were interested in trying to find out how are cities managing uh, some practical issues around uh, policies, promotions, and programming. And what we found was that design guidelines were fairly common. So around 70% of uh, those cities that we surveyed had bicycle design guidelines. Uh, about 80% of them here in the second, in the second uh, pie chart have cycling supportive policies. Uh, promotional campaigns, promotion is big. So more than 95% of all of those that we surveyed had bicycle promotion. And then on the right-hand side, you see that uh, the, the presence of a specific department responsible for implementing cycling, cycling projects is not as common. So about 55% of cities that responded to our, our survey said that they had a separate department. The other ones had this under uh, existing departments, perhaps public works, uh, perhaps a transportation department, uh, perhaps another unit within uh, the municipality in charge of cycling projects. And with that, I wanna pass it on to Pardo to talk uh, more about uh, recent uh, developments since COVID. Thanks, Daniel, and, and thanks for this opportunity. I'm going to race through a few things in Bogota. Of course, we could talk forever about all these things, uh, and but we time, of course, is is asking us to be brief. Uh, I just wanted to start with a shout out to Chris Morphus's take on how it is to cycle in Bogota, because I firmly believe that we need a lot of people from overseas telling us about how they see things so that we can improve. So I'm pasting the link there. Chris, I think is in the audience, so happy to have him here. I'm going to give a presentation, which I'll also share the link to in case you want to steal any of my pictures, please do. I'll give you a, a link to steal them from my Flickr because it's a, you can take them from Creative Commons. Uh, uh, so I'm going to zoom in to Bogota because I'm here. Uh, because a lot of interesting things have been happening and it's because sort of the, the place where I have the nicer pictures as well. Uh, so apart from everything else that, that Daniel was presenting and how we can start to understand the impact of COVID and how this was sort of uh, people were reacting to from government. First of all, I want to take a step back and sort of think about the very, very large a amount of actions that were done. This is from a paper that we wrote, uh, predominantly Tapcoms, but I was supporting that effort with a large database that you can also access when clicking on that link uh, uh, that you see below. That's why I'm also giving you the link to my presentation where we were reviewing many different things. And you can see the, the biggest amount of, of responses and actions were in terms of the street space for pedestrians and bicycles. So Bogota was one of those places which was doing a lot. Uh, they did do, apart from the 550 kilometers of bikeways, they also did 84 kilometers of temporary bikeways, which are now permanent. Uh, I'm not very good at miles, so surely somebody in the chat will tell us how much 550 kilometers is, close to 350 miles, I think. Uh, and 80 kilometers or something like 60 miles, maybe a little bit less. There was a lot of work on this. It was incredibly decisive. It was literally from one day to the next uh, that they did it. They iterated during three days and then they kept this. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in, in a few slides. The picture on the right is the example of how they did it at the beginning, which is basically just segregating with whatever they had in store and then on the left you see how it looks like today it's it's more permanent and more fixed uh, devices but not uh, fully civil works which would be a longer process but it is incredible that this city was able to build a great amount of segregated infrastructure in such a short time uh, and i feel that I, I'm, I'm very proud of my city and my government to have done this uh, but we're fighting the good fight now, which I'll also describe a little bit better. I think one thing that is fundamental to understand in why Bogota was so quick in doing this is that we have 
123 kilometers of bikeways, which is something around 80 miles of, of temporary cyclovia on Sunday, which makes it pretty easy for the government to actually activate this from one day to the next, because this is exactly what they do on Sundays. They expand the infrastructure uh, for people walking, cycling, dogging, <laughs> whatever, uh, uh, by means of very, very light infrastructure of temporary devices. And, and then they just create a new network uh, because this happens every Sunday since 1974. It was not really difficult to say, let's do this starting tomorrow, literally, because they knew where it was. They knew exactly how the operation had to do. It was basically a matter of how to do this, uh, preserving the safety and reducing the risk of contagion for people. On, on on the street, basically, who are operating that. There's two things which I think are also really important to understand. Uh, I, I, I lost the graph which was showing actually the same trend globally, uh, but in Bogota, there is a very, very big issue around uh, bicycle theft. Uh, the numbers are incredibly high last year. We hadn't finished the year and we had almost 10,000 bicycles having stolen, having been stolen. And, and this is despite the incredibly effective work that the Secretary of Security has been doing in getting the thieves because there are, there's a mafia of thieves of bicycles. They are incredibly well organized uh, as it happens with many mafias in the country. Uh, so it is, horrifying. It is very sad. It makes fewer people ride a bike. Uh, and if it weren't for that, I think we would have tons more cyclists. Uh, at this point, the last uh, OD survey that we had was around 6% of trips were by bike. Uh, last year, they did an estimate, very uh, uh, tropical estimate, let's say, and they arrived at 13% uh, of trips were being done during the pandemic by bicycle for several reasons, uh, scared of public transport, uh, not having a car, uh, new infrastructures, and then that increased to beyond twice. But, but the sentence of describing what that 13% is, is a little bit long to, to say. Uh, actually, John Pucker and Ralph Bueller was were presenting this in one of their articles, recent articles talking about how there was COVID uh, work on a, a in effect in, in transportation. So I think safety, theft are huge issues. Uh, uh, I, I fail to remember where there is one number on the amount of, of thefts that have been done globally, but Bogota is sort of, it is something that is really hurting. A second thing is that we are seeing bike lash, uh, which is this term that is normally used for uh, whenever you have a lot of bikeways or bicycle infrastructure being built, it is uh, the, the reaction from people who are uh, riding a car and who don't really understand uh, uh, physics and the size of a car in comparison to the size of, of a person in a bicycle. Uh, so we see this, like this is a, the, the person on the right is a, a, a journalist saying, what do you think about this lane taking a, taken away from cars? To which, of course, I, I responded, it's not being taken away. It's being replaced by twice as much lanes. So, so that is uh, one thing. The, the one on the left is a quasi-journalist saying absurd bikeways. It's a very poorly argumented uh, uh, article, which I'm sure you've seen a lot of in California and beyond. And, and then, of course, one of the major newspapers, is Cars versus Bicycles, which I'm sure all of you have seen in your different uh, uh, cities. I've pasted links to all this in, in the slides in case you want to see. And, and I think I'm closing with this, which is sort of more perspective. Like how, what do people say? This is a very non-representative sample. This is uh, more like a snowball sampling based on uh, email lists from a shared bicycle provider. So it's definitely skewed, biased, everything towards people who ride a bike. But in any event, I think 
having said that, it's interesting to see how those people are responding uh, to three questions. So this was a, a survey done in, or rather sort of a question sent in November, 2020, where uh, we asked them, what were you using in March, 2020? And how that was distributed. Then we asked the same people, what are you using in November? Still lockdown, but not really a stringent lockdown. And then you can see a lot of people teleworking, uh, 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 but a sizable proportion of people still uh, using active transport. And then we told them, what would you do? What do you predict you'll do when we are in a post-vaccine world? Uh, having asked that in November, 2020, without knowing when that world is, I think we don't yet know what that post-vaccine world is um, in this. And then you can see sort of how the proportion of trips that they are saying that will be preserved in active transport is, is pretty high. Uh, public transport is the, 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 the mode that suffers the most and telework seems to be preserved. I, I think that telework thing is going to be higher than that. And I think that individual motorized transport is much higher than, than what you see here. So I think that's my presentation. I don't remember. Uh, just to finalize in the seconds that I have left, I just wanted to promote my the link to my pictures because you can actually go to anywhere, uh, almost anywhere in the world except Russia and some other places and sort of click through. And, and for, for cycling advocates, you can click through to the cycling uh, 1,200 pictures that I have somewhere and download whatever but you want, use it for wherever you want, as long as it's non-profit use. And just tell me when you used it so that I, I'm very happy when people use my pictures, so please do. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Thanks very much. And then because and yeah, Carlos, uh, so glad you're here. Why don't you just, I'm sorry, uh, Daniel, why don't you just take over, Carlos. Sorry. I think it's now either Lorena or Rafael, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Rafael, help me. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for your invitation. Uh, thanks, Dave and your team. Thank you, Kalbaik. Uh, it's a pleasure to me and my team um, to be in this place. Uh, let's start how, uh, why, and for whom uh, we work on BC Activa Foundation. BC Activa Radio and BC Cinema are the programs uh, of our NGO. BC Activa Radio, uh, the first one. Uh, our work uh, brings closer the institutional affair with the cyclists uh, who uh, ride and work uh, in our city, Bogota. Uh, we make collectives, foundations, and activists in some cities know the government, and we bring uh, the closer the poli policy makers, police policy makers. Uh, and the and decision makers uh, by letting the cyclists know the institutional affair available for them. Uh, we are the radio by, uh, made by and um, for cyclists. Mm, we are uh, a media of communication that says we can all uh, be cyclists and uh, even in a city like Bogota really chaotic. Uh, we can be equal and we can all uh, enjoy this year. In Colombia, in especial in Bogota, uh, the cyclists need information and this Activa Radio provides it. Um, we are a, a grassroots a collective and many of ours have different day jobs. Uh, most of us did not have a communication diploma uh, but we have become reporters by trade. Uh, we produce our stories because we found out that there was a need in a series uh, for in the created for cyclists and by cyclists. Uh, bring bring it uh, to gap between in institutional effort and the citizens and spreading knowledge 
uh, of all typical uh, topic, topics related by biking uh, has been Biciactiva's main goal. Uh, our community radio and our NGO shows uh, that we all can be cyclists and we uh, all can be reporters of what is happening in our series. A network of reporters and activists uh, passionate for biking is the big uh, backbone of our organization. Uh, we would love uh, uh, to have more international reporters. We are um, Rafa, wait, wait. <laughs> mm. uh, the previous one, please. Uh, uh, you are uh, welcome to become a part of Bici Activa. Uh, Bici Activa's goal uh, is to tell the news uh, that cyclists need to the eyes of the community. And uh, we do through our network of reporters in different areas of Bogota, in different series of Colombia, and in different series of the world, Mexico, uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Europe. Um, Bici Activa was born uh, as a citizen mo movement, participating uh, in the community bike councils in Bogota, we will uh, continue as a citizen initiative carrying of the cycling community interest. The mainstream media uh, does not fulfill uh, that role uh, of telling the stories we as a cycling community care of uh, for and need to know. We step up uh, feeling that gap strengthened our community. We did not invent community radio or screening movies in a public spaces, but um, what I uh, do is to share the info, info cyclists need to care for. That is uh, our added value uh, and something that has helped us distinguish uh, in our job. After more than five years to work, uh, we have a strong network in, uh, of institutional alien, alliances uh, which help us uh, know key information in the local administrations that are uh, important for our community. When we facilitate the information, we will facilitate biking. Information is the power. Uh, as the saying goes, the broadcast, the broadcast alert, uh, discounts, recommend routes, uh, business venture activities, and many other topics uh, that are important for riders in Bogota and in Colombia. Next, Rafael, please. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of safety, this is a real problem in our city uh, where uh, 26 bikes are stolen per day, uh, 8,200 uh, so far in this year. Uh, so initiatives and activities for, uh, from institutions are important, but more important uh, for us is uh, that people that know them. Initiatives like uh, bike registr registration, uh, bike parking offered, infrastructure, uh, technology solutions, uh, and some others uh, provide solutions uh, to this issue. Also, uh, we, we help communicate uh, to the policy makers about the net and concerts of urban cycles. Uh, we lay bridges between the government and the ever growing cyclist community in Bogota and in Latin America. Uh, this work has been recognized by national and international uh, organizations. We have won several distinctions, uh, public grants and sponsorships which have helped uh, to us to fulfill uh, our role. We have uh, participated 
participated uh, in three national bike forums and in a world bike forum in Peru, Mexico, and Ecuador. Calbike sponsored uh, us to participate in the, to the California Bicycle Summit uh, 2019. Uh, we thank you for your support. Next profile, please. 2020 uh, was a very challenging year for our NGO. Before the corona crisis, we were uh, growing as a, a team, making, making more alliances uh, with universities and community broadcasters. Uh, since more, most of the uh, activists were uh, unavailable to meet uh, because the corona restriction, uh, we had to use our creativity uh, in order to keep contact during the different periods. One of the ideas that appeared was Bicinema uh, as a way to reappropriate it and resignificate uh, public spaces via the projection of movies of the biker and not biking community. Next, please. Bicinema is an initiative about a safe environment to share cinema and bike with friends and family. We project movies uh, on public spaces, mostly walls, uh, and we invite all uh, bike community to us join for a night culture, uh, leisure, and networking bike uh, between bike uh, communities, citizens, and uh, pass. Uh, passer uh, Like some experts said about the uh, in induce demand with a strong culture, uh, the demand for uh, friendly spaces, la lanes, and um, a uh, bike oriented policy uh, will be greater. Uh, our foundation, in association with some local government uh, office, offices, and has made a safety campaigns, giving helmets to workers and messengers with some socioeconomic difficulties uh, that provides them safety and their chances uh, to continue bike usage. And these are uh, our obje objectives, uh, to be a community communication media, free, uh, building networks, uh, having a scope with marginal communities, breaking city uh, divisions, uh, liking, uh, linking Bogota with the region and other cities. Uh, next profile, please. Uh, we have uh, very successful campaigns to raise uh, our uh, awareness. Um, for the safety of cyclists in Bogota, not only in terms of crime, uh, but also in terms uh, of road violence. Um, for one for them was to ask cyclists to publish the pictures of their friends and relatives with the hashtag, uh, someone waits for me at home. Um, we all have a loved one who wait for us at home. And sharing those pictures uh, help to put a face into the cycling community. Next, please. Uh, our ne next stop of the campaign was a paint a mural uh, with the hashtag in a critical area of the city and invite uh, local authorities uh, to the um, building uh, of the mural and the campaign with printed pictures uh, of the people who waited uh, waited for us at home. Via these uh, initiatives, the, the cycling community raised uh, awareness about issues that are important for us and broke our concerts uh, on the local government of Bogota. Uh, we are not only community radio, uh, we are community radio who cares for our communities. Next, please. 
finally, uh, in terms of culture and activists uh, in Colombia versus uh, USA. In Colombia, we grow with uh, the bike in our environment. It's a culture very close to us, owning um, a car is an aspiration, but it is not functional in today's series. Uh, versus the uh, USA, the bike is a sport element or um, like a toy because the long distance there uh, is are the reason, you know, um, the reason why it's uh, in some zones with necessary to have a car and some series uh, are car centric. Um, Bogota is very wide city, but the usage uh, of the bike is way spread. Uh, Bogota particularly has seen several decades ago a famous ciclovia, a lot of uh, activities of bike offers. Uh, like segregated bike lanes around the world. Um, nevertheless, the activist uh, at San Francisco uh, is a referent of the world. And in my opinion, it's a very different from uh, the one that occurs in Bogota. Uh, we are where we have uh, some groups, initiatives and collectives, but they don't uh, always work together. Uh, Next, please. Uh, however, uh, all the efforts of each uh, of us, the cyclists uh, are valuable to build the city we dream of a uh, special lead to help us become the world capital of the bicycle that we all dream so much. We, um, so, we hope to visit us soon. I'm Lorena Romero. I improved of uh, being this Activa Foundation's director. Uh, and if you have any questions, we will be happy to answer uh, them with help from Rafael, a filial member of this Activa, who will help to translate them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lorena and Rafael. Thank you so uh, very much. Uh, all of you uh, give great presentations. As John said, fantastic. Now we have about 30 minutes for a conversation. I encourage you to put a question in the question and answer box and we will do our best to direct them to the panelists and get them all answered. I'm gonna start with a question from, from John in the chat. And that is about bike theft. A lot of you mentioned bike theft. Uh, can you speak to the strategies that you know of in, in Latin American cities that are uh, working to, to prevent bike theft, to help people keep their bikes? I raised my hand, but I'm not sure if we're doing it through hands raised. Should I go? Go ahead. So, so I think there's one, when we reviewed once the data for theft in Bogota, we found out that one third of thefts are uh, because you're, you're actually, the person actually takes a knife at you or, or a gun. Uh, you're actually being mugged, it's one third. Another third of them is because you have been you haven't been careful in leaving your bike, so then your lock is not properly put. It's a bad lock, which is more around carelessness plus the fact that people steal bikes. And, and the other third is that you are uh, confused, let's say. Somebody's telling you, hi, I love your bike. Let me get a ride on, let me get a ride on your bike. And then, uh, well, they take it from you, basically. You, you're, you're being conned, right? So. I think that's an important portion of, of the answer to understand how bicycles are stolen. And then in terms of the measures, uh, understanding the amount, the types of thefts, where the bicycles go, like following the bicycles is really important. Uh, it's been done in several places in the world. And that's, that's a very good first step to understand sort of how to act. 
a bicycle registration system is something that can work as long as the complete cycle between theft, recovery, uh, and registry is, is properly linked together between owners of the bikes, uh, bicycle shops, a community that communicates what is happening with the bicycles. Uh, so bicycle registration may be a good thing. And then educating users towards having good bike locks. What is a good bike lock? How to take your lock and how to put it uh, in your bicycle is, is also fundamental. I mean, I'm sure in many of your cities, you already have seen a bunch of tires, front tires, very well locked to uh, to a bike parking, but not to the rest of the bike, which is a, sort of a standard mistake in 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 leaving your bike locked. So that sort of education is goes a long way. So I think that that's sort of what I what I think is important in terms of specific examples. They're all not wonderful, <laughs> so I'm sort of. Uh, at a loss in, in sort of finding great examples of very effective reduction in theft. Lorena, have you had a bicycle stolen? And if not, how did you, how have you prevented from getting your bike stolen? I'm sorry, I think Lorena is having some connection connection issues. So I, I will try to chip in while she solves that. Thank you. Um, well, in my case, I, I, I never had a, a bicycle stolen, but the trick is just to lock it and, and lock it again and keep locking it until you feel safe. And that's we pretty much what we do in uh, with BC Activa. We, as, as, as Carlos said, um, we try to uh, raise awareness of things like proper locking of the bikes and to share initiatives that could help to curb the uh, uh, the bike theft in the city. But nothing is perfect. Nevertheless, some people uh, try to come up with initiatives. Um, some um, uh, some technological initiatives, uh, devices that can tell if someone is next to your bike, devices if someone is trying to, to break the lock, is, is stuff like that. But as Pardo said, nothing is perfect and perfect, and there is still a long way to go. We have tried uh, to uh, raise awareness of urban cyclists uh, uh, about bike registration in the city. But that's far from perfect. That needs to be a complete cycle. We totally agree with, with Carlos in, in that. But we think it's a step in the right direction. Raina, do you have anything to add? Chris Morphis asked uh, a very deep question, you might say, a good question for each of you. I'm gonna ask every one of you to answer this question. And that is, it's a two-part question. What is your greatest hope for bicycling in Latin America? And what is your greatest fear over say the next 10 years? Greatest hope and greatest fear. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on on this one. Uh, so at, at the risk of being too too general, I th I think it is it is true that there is this general tendency to be uh, losing transit ridership. Uh, and if I were to guess, the the loss in ridership is about one percent per year in the region. Some places are losing transit ridership faster than that. Others a little slower. And so that's that's the basis for both my greatest hope and my greatest fear. Uh, my, my greatest fear is that those uh, trips that are leaving public transportation are going into uh, the automobile and into motorcycles. And that will mean, as a result, more pressure to prioritize auto-centric transportation policies. Uh, and, and that unfortunately will come to the detriment of, of bicycling. So that, that clearly is my major fear and, and part of showing the, the, the media, the intense debate in the media 
just simply uh, that what that we see here in the U.S. too in California about taking taking lanes from um, automobiles, e even even if they're totally underutilized, uh, or even better when they are uh, very utilized, and give them to bicycles because that's where that's where this that that's where the demand is going to be. Um, the converse is my greatest hope is that uh, the, those riders uh, would move into a bicycle and that we will be attracting many more users. I, I'm particularly keen about, about, about women. They are, they are overall underrepresented. Uh, the case of Bogota, uh, there's about a three to one ratio uh, from males to, from men to women in terms of bicycle use. Um, but we, we definitely want to attract, uh, also want to attract BRT users. I think it'd be parochial to want to keep transit users in transit if they want to move to a, to a mode that is more satisfying to them, uh, that means physical activity, means uh, being outdoors, by all means, let's, let's have them move to the bicycle. And then non-travelers, there's many people that would uh, want to be on a bicycle if it's, if it's both more secure against theft and safer from traffic and that uh, they can get to another city the way I did it in the Ciclovia that Pardo identified in the 1970s that opened the city to me and allowed me to develop this love for, uh, for cities uh, thanks to a bicycle and to the policies that allowed me to get around. So that would be my greatest hope. I'm going to say, Carlos, you're next. Greatest fear and greatest hope. So, so I guess I have, I have a long list of fears. Uh, my main fear is that, that, we, that the EV, the electric vehicle craze, takes over uh, to the extent that uh, people just start thinking that, a, that an e-motorbike is an e-bike and they go on the bikeway uh, because it will be... I mean, once their cost is reduced and they will go directly there rather than a bicycle. That, that is sort of a, a maybe a very elaborate fear of something that may happen in, in sort of the medium term in all of Latin America. But, but what I see is that the lack of proper regulation and enforcement of some vehicles, which are either an e-boat bike or a two-stroke, uh, horrifyingly uh, dangerous uh, engine, retrofitted onto bicycles is a huge problem uh, in many places. It's happened in Chile, for example, for a long time. Uh, their GDP increased, so then they started buying motorbikes. So, so the, the, the bicycle is a stepping stone towards other modes, which may not be sustainable, is a big fear, uh, despite the fact that I do love e-bikes, but those which are sort of the, the lower classes. Uh, speed, not, not, not high speed, uh, uh, those that are assisted, that kind of thing. So that is sort of one, I guess, conceptual, elaborate, long-term uh, fear. And, and sort of a related one is the theft and deaths in traffic because of, of a high uptick in cycling without corresponding action in the city governments. Uh, I've, I've worked in several cities in, in Latin America, and one thing that happens when, when governments are promoting cycling, but just in, in sort of what they say, but not really action in the ground, is that some people end up being run over because cars are just going too fast. And there's examples of cities which have stagnated growth of bicycles, very high risk of riding a bike, which makes them uh, not a nice place to ride a bike. And I won't say names, but there's several cities in Latin America that that have that. So, so I think that is sort of another fear. Uh, and then I guess hopes, like hope, uh, the hope is that people start using the bicycle more. That 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 the bicycle is actually is actually assigned significant budget for uh, infrastructure programming, uh, management, uh, and the entire bureaucracy of a bicycle policy. That that's what I think is 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 an important thing. Yeah, that's fears and hopes. Happy to give somebody else a try. Go ahead, Lorena and Raphael. 
Dave, I'm, I'm so sorry. I will uh, answer this question in Spanish and Rafael, translate it, please. Fears um, and hopes are, are hard to express in a different language. I understand. Bueno, para mí, eh, mi, mi mayor sueño es que las ciudades eh, estén hechas, estén diseñadas para las mujeres también. Creo que el tema de mujer, el tema de género es muy relevante en que... Y, y hace la diferencia en, en que las ciudades realmente pues, sean mucho más amigables para todos. Well, for Lorena, her, eh, her greatest hope is that cities are planned for women and take, take women into account. The gender topic is very, very important. Uh, we need to make sure that there is a city for everyone, including women. Ah, uh, y bueno, me parece que eh, en una ciudad como Bogotá es muy importante, es relevante y, y determinante el tema de la seguridad. A mí realmente me preocupa, me, me, no me ha pasado nada personalmente, gracias al universo, pero, pero me preocupa que la gente no pueda salir a montar bicicleta porque la roban y además de que la roban, la matan. O sea, me parece que es demasiado grave. O sea, ya que existan robos es muy grave pero que maten a una persona me parece gravísimo y de pronto no sé si exista una fórmula mágica para que eso deje de ocurrir, al menos en una ciudad como Bogotá, pero eh, me parece muy, muy preocupante. For Lorena, one of her greatest concerns is uh, bike theft, but not only because someone can take your, your bike, it's because someone can harm you and that's a big concern because Um, the, ma the main problem with that is uh, several things among the others that can hamper people to use the bike, but also that can uh, create uh, an environment that, that will prevent people from using the bike and can derivate in some other uh, problems. So there is no magic formula to solve that, but she hopes that we can find a proper way to improve in that field. James Salas asked a good question about how much the bicycle advocacy community in Latin America is using the climate crisis as a rationale for increasing the emphasis on bicycling. Um, I, I can add to the question that in my experience here in California, the folks who are concerned about the climate crisis and good advocates on it don't consider bicycling uh, an important enough solution. Um, they, they're into electrification of everything and not into changing uh, mode share. We're, one of our priorities in the coming years is to get bicycling included uh, as, as an important piece of the solution to the climate crisis. What's going on in Latin America in that regard? So, so I guess, um, I mean, first of all, yes, the Glasgow stuff and all these discussions around cycling and cycling being included in everything thanks to the cycling lobby, I think is a wonderful precedent. It's the first time that I see that that happens, despite having tried many times. But specifically to this question in the context of Latin America, if people are being killed in the street, either because their, their bicycles are being stolen or because they are being run over by a truck. So that has been sort of top of mind always. Okay, every time that you talk to people and you ask them, what would you like? It let's stop killing uh, uh, people on bicycles. So, so the climate crisis, despite people knowing that it is important, I, I haven't really seen sort of a, a big narrative arc around this, sort of as an argument to say, let's let's have cycling uh, be promoted. Uh, and, and probably it's because of what I just said, it's because of the, the huge concern around safety and security and theft and death, uh, which is sort of closer. I, I, and then more personally, I think that the climate crisis is fundamental, but it is, 
psychologically diff difficult for people to, to, to actually act based on it because their home is not being uh, flooded. So the, the, the lack of proximity to the consequences of climate crisis makes it difficult to use it as an argument to promote something. So I don't, I don't feel that promoting cycling because it is a solution to the climate crisis would get us anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. But, but it's, I'm very cynical. That's sort of my take on that. I, I, I wanted to add one, one more thing that is of interest. And I, part though, I have this, this similar reaction uh, in, your, in your response to uh, Jim Salas's question. Uh, the, the one, so it's not that surprising given kind of the time dimension and the, how amorphous it is in, 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 the, in the collective minds climate change versus the immediacy of the crashes. Chris Morphis just sort of posted that there's one fatality per week in bicycle fatality per week in Bogota. But the, the one area that it is a little surprising to me, and I would love to hear from uh, my co-panelists that isn't on the agenda more from bicyclists is air quality. Um, it, it specifically in Bogota, uh, some, some cyclists use masks. Uh, pre-pandemic pre to filter out particles and those masks in, a, in that 40 minute average trip length would become black with soot with black carbon and particulate matter. With the level of background concentrations that we have in many of our Latin American cities, uh, it is not out of the question to wonder whether it's actually bad for your health to bicycle, period. Um, and so the opponents of bicycling say, well, yeah, get off your bike. And I'm surprised that it hasn't become more of a call for action to clean the air so that everyone could be outdoors enjoying uh, the environment uh, healthily as opposed to risking their health. I wonder whether you have uh, suggestions or ideas about this. John, John asked whether or not health promotion has been a big incentive, and it, uh, it sounds like it hasn't. I'm going to switch to uh, a recreational question. Bruce Dougie asked, uh, how popular is trail cycling and mountain biking in South America? Uh, South America is a big place. Um, but what, what can you tell us about, uh, about the popularity of that kind of bicycling? Just have a quick thing on this. I, I, I'm trying to do a map, which I'm not very successful at, to, to sort of look at the, the altitude of the place where they were born and the successes of the, of the different cyclists, which have been very good at different uh, stages of either the Tour de France, uh, Giro, and Vuelta España. Uh, because my hypothesis is if they were born or have lived for a significant amount of time in a place which has a high altitude, they have done well, not just because of the, the red globules and whatever in their blood, but just because of the, the history and the culture. That is common to, just to try and answer the question. There are different places, especially if you go in the mountains, like through the Andes, where cycling is a big thing, or road cycling and mountain biking. Equality is, is huge on mountain biking. Colombia is huge on, on road cycling. Uh, from then on, you can find some, some, some other people which have been sort of uh, significantly using the bike. But, but I think those two countries are big. And also the, 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 the riders in sports have been big in, in sports. But I think there's, it hasn't been super documented. But happy to hear from others as well. Lorena, you want to add something? Thanks, Eric. Um, bueno, yo quisiera contarles que um, en Bogotá y en Colombia en general, no solo el ciclo montañismo, aunque también es muy representativo y está como muy dentro de la cultura y como en el día a día de la gente, eh, eh, realmente se genera mucha comunidad alrededor del de ciclo montañismo. Hay grupos súper grandes, muy consolidados, en, en, no solo en Bogotá y sus alrededores, que es donde se puede practicar, como en los alrededores de Bogotá, sino en Colombia. Hay, hay, hay grupos y hay una comunidad muy fuerte, hay un grupo que se llamó Parceros, que eh, pues genera una comunidad 
enorme y creo que eso realmente hace mucho la diferencia entre países eh, como Colombia y pues otros de Latinoamérica, incluso otros de Estados Unidos. Esa comunidad tan grande que se genera eh, a través de, del ciclo montañismo, yo creo que sí es muy cercano a nosotros, a nuestra cultura, genera comunidad y además, pues no sé, gente como eh, ciclistas como Egan Bernal iniciaron de hecho en ciclo montañismo, o sea, se reúne el pueblo se reúne la ciudad alrededor de competencias eh, como estas, pues de ciclomontañismo, que hacen pues incluso grandes campeones como eran. Ok, por el caso case, uh, particularmente en Bogotá, eh, hay grandes huge comunidades eh, centradas around el uh, mountain biking. Uh, And we're talking about communities uh, or groups that ride together and can amass, uh, although Lorena didn't tell numbers, I, I, will, I will step in to say, we have seen uh, numbers of bike cycling, cyclists that are like 100, 150 or more that, that go out uh, as a single group on a Sunday or something like that. And, Coming back to what Lorena said, uh, some famous cyclists like Egan Bernal started his career as a mountain biking cyclist. So for Lorena, the main difference would be that in, or one of the particular characteristics of mountain biking in Colombia and around, uh, and in, in Bogota and around the city, which are the mountains that we could use to To, to ride or, or mountain bikes, is that uh, it creates a big uh, community. And these communities are very, uh, are very tied together. And that uh, creates a very strong movement. So yes, mountain biking in Colombia is very important, is quite popular, and you're all welcome to try it. It's awesome to ride the mountains of Colombia in a mountain bike. I have a question about ciclovías. I was just in Los Angeles on Sunday for what was a fantastic event, so beloved by the community. People come from all over the region to ride their bikes. This was on Martin Luther King in South LA. They, they close um, about a six mile section of the roadway. And that's it. In Mexico City, they close about a 35 mile section roadway every single Sunday. They do it two or three times a year, maybe maybe a little more uh, at its peak in Los Angeles every single Sunday in Mexico City. And I know Bogota has one, I believe, every single Sunday. Um, what can you tell us about the importance of those events in Latin American cities? And what, what can we, you know, should we try to emulate what they're doing there and do them every single Sunday? I don't know if there's specific data to point to increase in Zigloia and then increase in, in, in youth. I, th there was once this discussion where we arrived at something that we called the, the Monday hangover because you have 2 million people going out on Sunday and then all of a sudden you have 300,000 going on a Monday. And so what happened? Like what, where did you go? Uh, but I know that Daniel is, is working on, on this beautiful project on health uh, and transport, which So maybe he has. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Carlos. So uh, the work of our colleague Olga Lucia Sarmiento at University of Los Andes uh, to qu quantify uh, the physical activity, for example, and, and how much time is spent in the Ciclovia in Bogota has been wonderful in highlighting the, the multiple contributions of the Ciclovia. So from what you say, Dave, absolutely right, opening the city to uh, all the users and I think kind of desegregating what is a fairly segregated city so that people can visit parts of the city that they don't go to normally and interact with people that might not see on a daily basis uh, is, is a great contribution uh, in addition to the physical activity benefits and the outdoor benefits in, in a city like many in Latin America that don't have a lot of public spaces, that don't have a, a lot of green spaces. Uh, what made the Ciclovia in Bogota uh, and in Guadalajara and other places uh, particularly um, effective was 
not not only the the space and the policies around the space, but also the programming. So increasingly, there are community events uh, around physical activity, around yoga, around aerobics, um, even art, sort of public art that brings the community together. So it, it is kind of morphing from uh, rolling exclusively to a place where people come together and express community. And, and in that way, it has really become very powerful. Now, now it's owned by the city by the population. Uh, they lament the, the weekends. Uh, there's a couple of weekends a year where it doesn't happen for, for logistics and holiday reasons, but there's kind of a, a lamentation of like, wow, not today, not, not, not today, Sunday, this is a bummer. I wanted to go out today. Um, so uh, I, would, I would push towards sort of thinking about adoption, really being innovative. And LA, in fact, has been quite innovative in terms of its ability to overcome some of the constraints uh, that uh, has limited the, the implementation of Ciclovias in the US. One of them is having to pay overtime for police uh, in order to close streets. Uh, it becomes a significant expense in the US. So being innovative about how to deal with uh, uh, closing those spaces, and I think COVID might have been a great catalyst for that, is a great opportunity. I know Lorena wanted to say something maybe, or Rafael. Um. Yeah, we, we would like to share like the, the vision from a grassroots movement. And although, of course, it's very important to quantify the real effects of someone that is dearly beloved to all in our city. But for us as a grassroots movement, uh, the Ciclovia is a big facilitator because it gives us a place to gather together every Sunday. And it gives us an excuse. Also, it provides access to the city, as Daniel just said, in a very segregated city, which has, which sometimes lacks a lot of different spaces for leisure and in which sometimes could be quite frantic, frank, frantic or very stressful. It's incredible to have almost the whole street for you, or you feel that the street is only for you. And in my particular case, that was incredible when I was learning how to ride my bike. And one of the most beautiful things that I see on, on, on the Cicloria, it's parents with their kids teaching them how to ride their bikes. Although there can be some problems, or, uh, and we were discussing this with, with Lorena a bit. So for us in, in Bici Activa, we would like to invite other 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 countries to, to try to emulate this model. We, of course, we have to take into account paying, paying their, their, their dues to police and other things. But what Ciclovia did for people is to expand their access. And it's a great excuse to start riding your bike. Lots of us, why do we love the Ciclovia? For some of us, it's just because we, we rode our first, first bike and we took off our, uh, for the first time our training wheels in the Ciclovia. And that's something that several of us, and I think some of other fellow people from Bogota can relate. You don't forget that. You don't forget that experience. We're going to wrap up here uh, pretty soon. That's a beautiful comment, Lorena. It is the city's soul. Um, I want to give the panelists uh, a last chance to get a point across that you uh, feel is really important for us. I don't know. Follow me on Twitter. I'm, I'm taking a break, but well, I guess I can tell you more there. Uh, Dave, I, I love the opportunity to learn from the South. Uh, you know, too, too often the information, fads, trends, policies flow north to south. And it's, it's wonderful to learn from the successes of, of places that have been, by necessity, had to be more innovative and have already taken uh, uh, shortcuts to do things that are great and that we can certainly implement in our California city. So thank you for this, uh, for this venue, this opportunity. 
Eh, bueno, pues muchas gracias por la invitación y además muchas gracias por crear estos espacios. Calbike realmente es súper valioso porque eh, nos ayuda a generar comunidad y creo que eso definitivamente es lo más valioso que podemos hacer por la bicicleta y pues por las comunidades que, que impactamos con nuestro trabajo. Muchísimas gracias y nos vemos en abril. Bueno, well, Lorena just said, thank you so much, Dave, for the invitation and thank you so much, Calbike. What you did is very, very important because you need communities and bring communities together. And that's one of the most important things that we can do to promote and to, to encourage people to ride their bike. Uh, so thank you very much, she says, and see you in April. And, and I will say that uh, the takeaway message is um, <clears throat> if anybody can, can ride a bike, also anybody can become a reporter and an advocate for biking. And that's our invitation. Uh, here at BC Activa, we are a small community media, but we like to invite any of you. If you have anything interested, interesting to report, just contact us and we will find a way to, to, to spread the message across because we can all be cyclists, but we can all be reporters uh, of, about biking. So uh, again, as Lorena said, thank you very much for this wonderful invitation. Well, it's gracious of you to thank us um, because really we're just doing this for our own benefit. Like Daniel said, we know that we have a lot to learn from the South. I think, I think uh, uh, for reasons I don't have to go into, too many establishment bike advocates look to Northern Europe for solutions. And uh, we know better than that. We know that we can learn from all over the world, especially from uh, Latin America. Um, so you're helping us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we expect to keep learning, uh, keep teaching each other. We'll see you in April. I'm glad that you're coming. Um, with that, I want to remind folks that you can uh, get uh, a discount for the summit by registering today using the discount code that Kevin just pasted into the chat. And I'm going to throw in one more sweetener to the deal. And that is, you can get this book. If, if you register today, we'll send you a free copy of uh, Cycling for Sustainable Cities. This is the book that uh, John Pucher and Ralph Bueller did. There's a chapter on uh, cycling in Latin America in this book. Um, it, is, it is like a, a, um, an encyclopedia, really, uh, for bike advocates. It's, I would, I would uh, give it to your uh, uh, city planner uh, as proof that this can be done. So uh, with that, I want to uh, thank uh, our team, uh, Stephanie and, and Kevin behind the scenes. And thank you all for uh, joining us. And, and one last thank you to the panelists. Thank you all very much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you.